Hi, my name is Rich Koslerich. I'm a distinguished visiting professor here at the Shar School of Policy and Government at George Mason University. Among other things, I teach a course in geopolitics of energy security. Uh, and I'm the former U.S. ambassador to Azerbaijan and, and Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, it's really a pleasure to welcome you to the 23rd annual Fall for the Book Festival. Uh, these free online events run uh, the past, last two weeks of October and, and can be uh, rewatched at any time on Crowdcast or uh, our YouTube channel. So to follow us on Crowdcast, uh, click uh, the fall for the book icon above this window and then click follow or subscribe to YouTube. Uh, the link will, will be in the chat and uh, take a look at the little green button down there, uh, buy the book. <laughs> I highly recommend it. Uh, and and it's it's just a, a real pleasure to, to introduce uh, uh, Klaus Dodd, uh, professor of uh, geopolitics at Royal Hollingway at the University of London. Uh, among other things, uh, Klaus has been an advisor to NATO and, and most interesting for me, uh, you know, your work with the UK Parliament on the Arctic. Uh, one of my segments in my geopolitics of energy class just a couple of weeks ago was the Arctic. So uh, this, is, this is timely in, in so many ways. But, but this book, uh, The New Border Wars, uh, just, just really frames what we think about in traditional ways in a different way. And, and I, I'm really curious, uh, you know, Klaus, as you thought about this book and, and wrote it, kind of what, what motivated you to, to write this book and to write it in the way, way that, you, that you did? Because uh, this is not, in some sense, a, a new issue, but the way you frame it is. So how did that happen? <laughs> um, well, Thank you very much, Rich, um, for the for the invitation to participate and, and and really for taking the time to read the book so carefully and and to sort of reflect um, on the issues raised. I mean, I think I think the the genesis of the book actually um, comes in, in a, a, really a, a sort of several ways. I think first of all, um, I actually had the pleasure of writing a monthly column for a UK magazine called The Geographical. And the editor asked me, and this is over 15 years, you know, he said, uh, pick, pick some quirky border conflict or <laughs> geopolitical item that readers probably wouldn't be aware of or never thought about before, and then try to explain to them why it's interesting uh, and why it, for example, might make you rethink what you thought you knew about borders. So one of the challenges I think I pose myself in the book is to say, how can we think about borders in, in ways that don't always focus on the line on the map or don't always think of the border as that physical distinction, that point of distinction, say, between the United States and Canada? You know, what happens if we think of borders as, as more mobile? Or what happens if borders have a, 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 an ability, if you like, to stretch or contract, or perhaps borders even stick to people? So uh, one of the things I was also motivated by to write the book was um, the experience of being a specialist advisor for the UK Parliament. And I did it for both the House of Lords and the House of Commons. And to give you a quick illustration of how borders can work, uh, in order to take up the position, I had to fill out a security questionnaire. So I needed a parliamentary pass to be allowed into Parliament. One of the questions they asked was, where do your mother and father come from? Now, my mother was born in Austria and grew up in South Africa, and she became a British citizen eventually in 1962. Well, they said to me, in order to process your parliamentary pass, your mother needs to prove she's a British citizen. So I had to get on the phone to her and say, I'm really sorry to ask you, but do you by any chance have that letter from 1962 that demonstrates you are a legitimate British citizen? So she had to go up into the loft, the attic of our house, and go and try and find that letter. One of the reasons she had to do that was because the then Home Secretary, which is our kind of Secretary of the Interior, decided that the working environment of the UK needed to be a great deal more hostile to those who might be here illegally. And when you use migration and borders and put the two together to create this hostile environment, 
it ends up having implications for everybody, including citizens. And so it's just a kind of illustration that some of that, some of those topics I cover in Border Wars is also tainted by personal experiences. My mother always says to me, I've been a British citizen for 60 years, but they never let me forget I came from somewhere else. And I think I was quite sensitive to those kinds of things. And I think the final thing is, as the book tries to talk about as well, it's hard not to talk about borders and to think about some of the contemporary and future challenges we know we're going to face as, as, as humanity and climate change, public health are clearly, I think, going to have ramifications for how we, how we border the world uh, more generally. Yeah, that that point about you know you carry your nationality on your back your border on your back I, my uh, my father uh, his family came from uh, came from Croatia well it was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire long story about you know how they uh, they left in 1910 but when I became ambassador to Bosnia and Herzegovina all of the uh, the Croats you know, figured I was going to be their best friend, that I was going to espouse the, you know, the extreme nationalist positions of Croat people. And I made it quite clear, I was a U.S. <laughs> diplomat representing the United States. I was not, by virtue of the Kozlerich, you know, representing that that nationality. But, but I think it's really important because that can be, you know, as you point out, kind of a, a negative thing, but sometimes it can be a positive thing as well, because it gives you a, a, a bit of credibility in, in, in a professional sense. Um, you know, one thing, one thing is, you know, you were, you were talking, uh, thought about my, back to my geopolitics of, of energy class. And one of the first readings I give, give my students is Halford McKinder's 1904 article. And, uh, you know, I've, I've kind of convinced myself that here's someone, you know, back in the midst of time who kind of set the, set the table as you described it for, uh, for uh, geography, geopolitics and, and points on, on the map. And, and then fast forward, uh, I also assign a, a new book that Dan Jurgen has written that he calls the new map, which is energy, climate and clash of nations. And so, you know, it's this kind of bookends here, you know, between, you know, what Jürgen is talking about, what you're talking about, and then this classic definition that, that you know, I think pops into to people's mind when they think about geopolitics. Um, but I think you've done a good job. I mean, maybe, maybe there's some other areas that you see as gaps in, in how either politicians or, or uh, you know, the public more generally think about, uh, think about borders uh, when, when we look at them. Yeah, I, mean, I think that's really that's a really interesting point in terms of the public imagination um, when it comes to borders. So, for example, um, I think it would not be, I think, unreasonable to say that the previous U.S. administration um, was 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 rather preoccupied with the with borders and what I call bordering as a process. Yes. So, I think, for example, you know, when when President Trump and others said they want to build a beautiful wall. Um, you know, I think I think that was operating at two levels. One was a kind of the physical, which was thinking about, say, the U.S.-Mexican border as a place that needed further fortification or, or protection or surveillance. But I think, and I'm not the first to make this point, I think also borders operate at that sort of psychological, yes. imaginative level. And we often need borders to, to feel safe in the world. Um, and so fencing barriers, walls, um, psychologically also protect us, um, as well as, of course, making it perfectly clear that, um, you know, we, we, we don't necessarily want others to cross over those borders. But what my book also tries to explore as well is that we can often be quite conflicted and contradictory about borders. So we might say on the one hand, um, say, if you took Norway and Russia, Norway would have a very, very particular view of that border with Russia and be rightly concerned about um, contemporary Russia and whether they, would, they can feel secure as an independent nation state. But then if you travel, for example, as I have done, to the border of Norway and Russia, what you discover is that um, there is a special visa regime that enables mm. citizens on both sides of the border to travel up to 30 kilometers either side without a visa 
And so one of the one of the sort of I think the the experiences that many people in the audience will also be familiar with, if you live close to a physical border, you often have a very different view of it as opposed to living and working, say, in Washington, D.C. Yeah, I, I think about the Berlin Wall and the experience of, of people uh, there. And, um, you know, as you talk about modern physical borders, uh, you know, we can't can't overlook what uh, what's going on in, in Israel between the Israelis and Palestinians, where there's this effort to create a wall that somehow will solve problems that that really need to be addressed by people sitting down and talking to each other. Uh, and, and it's it's kind of a tragic uh, reminder, I think, that physical barriers do not solve problems. They either freeze them or make them worse. Uh, probably makes yeah. it worse. Um, yeah. it, when when you you know you you write about border conflict, and that's you know that that kind of the, <laughs> the stuff that keeps diplomats employed, uh, you know, uh, throughout throughout their professional life. But you, but you talk about three kinds of of, uh, of border conflict. You've got the physical kind. Um, you've got what you call orthodox, uh, which I'd, I'd like you to talk a little bit more about. And then the novel, which which I think you've hinted at with climate change, but also you you talk about space and water and subsea. So, um, you know, it, it I, I think it would be interesting to, to see how you how you frame those three categories. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's that, that, that actually for me was one of the hardest things to work through. Uh, in my own thinking about borders, because one of, one of the things that I think you quickly start to appreciate is how things become blurred or how they become interspersed with one another. But it, just to sort of recap briefly, what I try to do is distinguish between those borders that have, in essence, are really very sharply tied to the physical geographies of the earth. So there was tremendous effort and investment made in trying to map and demarcate the edges of nation states or the edges of empires. So for example, you know, uh, mountains in particular were incredibly challenging uh, as surveyors and mappers were sent up to ridges and peaks and tri triangulation points established. So you know, in essence, surveys could then lead to maps and countries on either side of those borders, you know, often went to considerable expense and effort to see who could produce the, the better map or the more detailed map of the shared border. And there are you know, lots of stories of disputes about maps misrepresenting a shared border. Um, and you know, if anybody's been to India and Pakistan, um, you'll know that uh, these are what I would call cartographic cultures. I mean, maps matter. And where you put the line of control or don't is is really a, a, a sort of you know can be a national security talking point. So so that so when I use that term physical, I was trying to get at that sort of border border making, I suppose, and and how the earth has been bordered and all the complex rules we've we've sort of brought into existence to try and determine where we might put a border through rivers or glaciers or lakes. The orthodox it really refers to those. Um, problem areas that continue to generate um, conflict and instability. And some of it's not terribly subtle. So for example, where we have no man's lands, where we have lines of control, green lines, um, you know, where we have areas that are continuously disputed, or where we have places that, are, you know, countries won't recognize, and in part because they don't want to hardwire borders, that sort of thing continues to haunt the political geographies um, of our world. And then finally, I was looking at also the sort of the novel or the emerging. So some of that might be about extraordinary spaces. So for example, outer space, the polar regions, the deep seas. And, and you know, even this week, for example, you know, we've had certainly in Britain stories about deep seabed mining and the yes. kind of the, yes. you know, the border tensions that generates. Um, and then, you know, I also talk about the digital border. So for example, as, as many people be aware of, pre-pandemic, I suspect more, more obviously now than post, um, every time, for example, we fly, uh, 
you know, we have to give our advanced passenger information as part of the check-in. And there's that sense in which data and the digital go with us. So when we get scanned or we get QR coded, you know, part of the, the border work is done through data and the digital or through our smartphone, for example, as the, as the object of choice. So it was really trying to do justice to mm -hmm. the, the, the different kinds of border tension and conflict, and yet also recognize that actually separating out these things was also quite tough because the physical and the digital often interact with one another. Yes, yeah. And that, that's a good point too, because these are not discrete categories in and of themselves, but they, they are helpful when we start looking at, uh, you know, the world around us, the kinds of conflicts that we see uh, to, to, to maybe think of, of them in different terms and different kinds of, of interrelationships. I, you know, I'm glad you mentioned uh, deep sea uh, mining as an issue. And I, you know, I think we're, as we getting semi into the, the climate change issue, but as we talk about energy transitions going from fossil fuel base to, to renewables or, or low, no carbon, um, you know, new minerals start to become really, really important. And, you know, traditionally, uh, you know, some of those like cobalt or on land in, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, which poses a whole set of other issues, but some of them may be under the sea. And, you know, for Americans, uh, I don't think we realize that while there is a law of the sea treaty, which now is several decades old and probably needs to be refreshed to say the least, the United States was never party to that. And so if, if we're talking about now uh, needing to look offshore for some of these minerals that are going to be necessary for this new energy world, we need some kind of idea of what the borders are. I mean, what are the limits on what an individual country or company can do uh, versus where the common, uh, the common good is, I guess, beyond, beyond national borders. But I think that that's really a, it's something that we really have to think about because that's a change uh, that that's uh, going on around us right now. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that's really important. Actually, that point about, um, for example, legal frameworks and whether they're still fit for purpose. So, to, you know, to come back to your point about the United States, I mean, for me, one of the great mysteries I've never I've never really understood as as a sort of very interested observer of your country is why the Senate can't quite bring itself um, to say yes to the law of the sea framework, because the United States was in the thick of those negotiations. And really the framework is tremendously advantageous to the huge coastal states, which the United States is of course one. Um, and one of the reasons for the objection, I think historically, has been the references to deep seabed mining and the common heritage. So the idea that there might be certain resources on the seabed because of their inaccessibility, because they're beyond the reach of a coastal state, should in essence belong to everyone in terms of benefit. And I think there was a lot of misgiving about that. But on the other hand, the United States has, as part of customary international law, of course, accepts many, many of those elements sure. of international law, as you know. But I think, you know, another way of looking at it, and this does link back to climate change, is when the law of the sea was negotiated, which was in the 1970s and signed in 1982, nobody was talking about climate change. Yes, so one exactly. massive change over the last 40 years is that I don't think we can be as confident anymore where land ends and sea begins. So we've got this weird situation where we're reading stories about deep seabed mining somewhere in the Pacific Ocean. But at the same time, we've got islands in the Pacific Ocean that have such an uncertain future, they may simply disappear. And that raises all kinds of tragic issues about whether those countries cease to exist, both physically and legally, if they're submerged. Yeah, and you know, that takes me to the Arctic, you know, where uh, you know, Russia has begun to assert claims um, that, uh, you know, potentially could, could lead to, uh, I won't say conflict, but certainly, uh, lead to disputes with others. And the U S is asserting principles that are embodied in the law of the sea treaty, yet we can't use those principles in this, this particular, this particular aspect. I, the, 
you know, what's the best mechanism uh, for international cooperation? And maybe there isn't one, but you know, we think about now deep sea mining, think about outer space, uh, thinking about the Arctic where, you know, almost, uh, you know, under the radar screen to, to literally use that expression in that part of the world, um, you know, US, Russia, European uh, countries, Canada have been cooperating in the Arctic Council um, you know, without a treaty, without a binding set of agreements, without bringing in security issues. Uh, and, and that's, that's one kind of maybe specific mechanism of cooperation. Uh, Law of the Sea was, you know, based on treaty, a binding, binding treaty commitments. Uh, I don't know what's going to come out of Glasgow, uh, you know, in terms of, of how do you, um, in a sense, how do you force obligations on countries who may not in their own political system be able to apply the same uh, the same principles when they're looking at, at borders so what whether they're they're physical or otherwise yeah I, I mean I think that's such an important um, question and, and, and also challenge so you know if we think about what borders do I mean you know they they connect they divide they orientate they prohibit they facilitate and I think in places like the Arctic, where there's been a substantial history of cooperation and collaboration, yeah. it has often been made possible by a combination of rules, you know, legal frameworks, but also a huge amount of effort being made around that sort of bilateral regional diplomacy. So I think the kind of work that, you know, you have done for your professional career it is going to remain hugely important. And we've got all kinds of interesting, you know, things to think about in terms of this kind of Zoom era, you know, does diplomacy work in quite the same way right. um, when we can no longer assume we can get round the table and talk face to face? Um, I think the other thing that's worth saying is that, um, you know, we've also got to be honest with one another in terms of those international legal frameworks. So for example, are we absolutely convinced that when, for example, third parties uh, tr you know, trespass or transgress uh, against really fundamental norms and, and rules, and don't get punished. Then what? 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 What are the implications that follow right. from that? But at the same time, and this is where COP twenty six climate change comes back as well. China is the world's biggest emitter, you know, and we may not care for many many things that China does, but we certainly don't want China disconnecting or walking away from those climate change negotiations and commitments. And even if net zero 2060 may not be ambitious enough for some, I mean, I for one, I'm tremendously uh, grateful for the fact at this point, at least, there is at least some commitment, but we're not gonna be misty eyed about this. You know, yeah. borders, resources, nationalism, climate change make a think for a potentially toxic combination. I mean, this is, this is not going to be straightforward. Yeah. And, you know, when we think, again, the, you know, the climate change issue is a transporter one. And, and if we're, we're only talking to individual nation states about what they're going to do within their own boundaries, I mean, it, 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 there, there's, a, <laughs> there's a conflict there inherent in, in uh, you know, making people believe that, you know, if they just say they're going to make a commitment or uh, do, undertake measures, uh, like you say, that only apply within their borders and not necessarily for activities that go beyond. That's, I mean, that's if, really if, we, if we think about the Paris, you know, Paris agreements in 2015 right. and the so-called nationally defined contribution, yes. I yeah. mean, you know, it, it, it raises the obvious tension that we have a world that for the last couple hundred years has, has been composed of nation states, some of whom are very recent because of decolonization and the ending of formal empire. And yet, as you and I and the audience know, we face a whole series of what have been described as super wicked problems, climate change and public health being two of the, the most obvious, which clearly don't you know, work well with the sort of political and legal boundaries that make up our world. And I think you know, that's why we've, we've had these really awkward um, conversations and experiences around borders because they, they, they clearly matter to national communities and nation states. But we also know perfectly well that, you know, things like migration, for example, don't necessarily get controlled 
by hard physical borders. If it was that easy, um, you know, then yes, by all means, build the beautiful wall. But we know perfectly well that's not going to stop migration in the US, the UK, or anywhere else for that matter. Well, one of the, the at least I find interesting aspects of, of the Arctic region is the indigenous peoples who, you know, uh, in some cases, you know, move across what are what are physical borders. They have interests that are separate from the quote nation state, uh, and figuring out a way to accommodate those interests uh, in in what traditional traditionally has been state to state. Uh, mechanisms is really, really important. I I don't know enough about it to be able to pass judgment on whether it's been successful or not within the Arctic Council, but I think the idea of, of doing uh, doing that sort of thing, and, it, and it's not just in that region. I mean, you've got populations who who cross, I mean, I think of the Kurds in the Middle East, you know, they, they have no nation state, but there are, you know, five or six countries uh, there that are uh, you know, have Kurdish populations, uh, and how do you how do you accommodate those those interests as well? I, uh, it, it, in a way, it's kind of one of those orthodox conflicts. But on the other hand, it it you know poses a different kind of set of issues than we're used to. Yeah, I mean, I think I think so. I think for me, there are several things that come out of you know that that sort of really interesting observation. I mean, you know, if we think about borders and diasporas, for example. Yes. And um, you know, let me offer a, another personal reflection. You know, my wife is Armenian, and so one of the things that um, you know you you instantly think about is the Armenian diaspora, and and when it comes to, for example, the borders of Armenia and the really difficult disputed relationship with Azerbaijan on the one hand, the historic difficult relationship with Turkey on the other, it's difficult to think about borders without right. thinking also about the role that diaspora plays, whether it's in the US, the UK, France, the right. rest of the Middle East. Um, and I think diasporas also, uh, in essence, transport the border somewhere else. So yeah. when the Armenian diaspora or the Croat diaspora lobbies Washington DC, in essence, the border moves with them as well. Yes. So it's not stuck in one place. I think the other thing about indigenous peoples in the Arctic and elsewhere, in many cases, after years of struggle, they have in, in, their, in, in their own right become substantial um, land rights owners, or they have rights to resources. And that means there is, they're also able to border, if you will, their traditional homeland territories and to insist that some things happen here as opposed to there. And then finally, I would say, which is really interesting, I mean, I think in terms of these complications, you know, historically in the US and in Canada, you had indigenous peoples also right. supporting migrants. So we had indigenous people supporting, for example, Chinese migrants at really difficult moments when there was sort of anti-Chinese riots and, and ill will uh, in the 19th and 20th century. So there are all these kind of complications where the border can get turned inside out and where communities can act in solidarity with one another, as if to say, you know, we, we sort of what push back, if you will, against the dominant border. Uh, whatever that might, wherever that might be found. Yeah, to, I, I think to our our discredit as Americans, we we overlook the uh, you know our indigenous populations and their rights. Uh, you know, as if this were only a problem of the 19th century. Uh, but you know, we were reminded of this just a few years ago when uh, this pipeline uh, that was going to be going from Canada through the United States and and uh, suddenly. <laughs> You know, the indigenous population said, we've got a treaty <laughs> with Washington that says, you know, these are our lands, our, you know, our ancestral uh, burial grounds are here. You have to take account of that. You can't just simply make a decision about something that otherwise would seem like st strictly an economic or commercial uh, commercial reason. And I, th I think we're going to, as you say, we're going to be confronting that kind of um, conflict, if you will, that centers around borders that aren't necessarily the uh, the ones that uh, that we we traditionally think of. Um, yeah, you know, yes, I, yeah. No, and just sorry, just simply to say, I, I couldn't agree more. So I think again, I think one of the reasons we 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 need to just keep thinking of borders as really dynamic is not to be tempted to think 
that just because we think the border is settled, and I, I mean, and that could be sort of psychologically as well as on the ground, it doesn't mean everybody else thinks the same. And I think I couldn't agree more in terms of indigenous communities. You know, those those struggles for recognition, for autonomy, uh, the right to be consulted aren't going to go anywhere. And we see this all over the Arctic. Yeah. Indigenous peoples are, you know, sort of making it clear, you know, we don't want resource uh, extraction. Uh, or if we do, we want to be told about it and we want to benefit from it yes. as opposed to you simply imposing it on us. Yeah. I, when you were talking about physical maps, uh, you know, I couldn't help but think uh, back to my time as ambassador of Oz in, in Azerbaijan and you know, the tragic conflict there that, that you, you describe in, in terms of your wife's experience. But, you know, in, in trying to, to move forward, uh, both the, the Azerbaijanis and the Armenians have, have border disputes separate from the, the Nagorno-Karabakh. So uh, the, the Azerbaijanis had a map from the Soviet period. The Armenians have a map from the Soviet period. They were done by two separate elements of the the Soviet government, and so which one which one is right? And, and you know whether it's whether it's the Balkans or, or the Caucasus, you know it seems like everybody has a map, you know, and, and that becomes it, the map becomes the the reason for the conflict as opposed to the more underlying reasons which are hard to deal with and people don't want to. To deal with them, I think, quite frankly, and, and we have to be be careful about believing that somehow there are physical maps that can solve problems that otherwise have to be be dealt with uh, dealt with elsewhere. Yeah, and I think I think that maybe you know that's also probably a wider message about climate change as well is yep. that sometimes there really there really isn't that technical, almost scientific solution to hand. You know, we can't just say if only we could border better. You know, the problem we have, I think, in so many parts of the world is wherever you put the border, it, at one level, it doesn't really matter. You know, you've got these underlying structural factors. You know, it might be historic memories. It might be perpetual injustice. It might be, it might just simply be because those border communities don't want the border um, because they just want to get on and interact with one another. And I remember being in India and Pakistan and, you know, one of the most really moving experiences you can have is to watch families on either side of that borderline, you know, a, a consequence of the British and the partition in the late 1940s, sort of interacting with one another, but separated by this big, big, big gate, this barrier. And I think, again, you often get this disconnect between, you know, national governments pouring over those maps, seeking yeah. advantage, yeah. and those communities on the border simply just wanting that you know day to day interaction and probably not right. worrying too much where the line goes yeah and, and it's it's all too easy whether you're a diplomat or even an academic to ignore the human dimension to all this yes. and i i think uh, that's really really critical i one question that occurred to me is because you you're a real academic i'm kind of part time and <laughs> practitioner whatever in terms of my background but after you've written this book have you changed the way you teach about geopolitics? I mean, has has it had that kind of an impact as well? And and what are the sorts of, I guess, what are the sorts of patterns we should now be helping students understand when when we talk about geopolitics? Yeah, I, I mean, that's that's a, I think incredibly important in terms of our practice. And I don't make the distinguish by the, the distinction, by the way, between you and me in terms of our academic <laughs> posts. Um, because I think, to be honest with you, I think in terms of serving our students, whether they're in George Mason or, or Roy Holloway, um, what we what we need to do, I think, is is to make sure that our students understand that. Borders, I think, work in a, a variety of ways, as I said earlier, in terms of connecting, dividing, facilitating. I think we need to make sure that our students understand that, um, you know, the line on the map has to be contextualized with lots of other uh, things and that you can't see anything, I'm afraid, in, in isolation. So we need to think about the role and function of borders, the types of borders. And we absolutely need to make sure that our students understand the human consequences of borders, as well as the ecological consequences of borders. And some of that can be really good. 
you know, we, we should point our students to areas where nation states or communities have learned to live with borders and have actively collaborated and cooperated with one another. And some of that can be frankly dreadful in terms of, you know, not sharing water, for example, or managing things poorly because, you know, you're not that bothered about the downstream community. And I think the other thing I would say is that we also need to think about how borders connect up to nationalism yeah. and also social justice. I mean, you know, borders can feel really, really unfair to some people, but borders can also feel absolutely necessary to others. And we need to have that honest conversation with our students in terms of why is it that, you know, for some people, the US-Mexican border has to be protected at all costs, whilst others might say, no, no, we, we, we need to have a more generous policy towards the border in terms of supporting those who are in desperate need. You know, we need to understand all of those, if you like, um, viewpoints and, and try and make sense of where they come from and, and what on earth we're going to do about it, because the world we're going <laughs> to confront, you know, is only going to get tougher. Um, and, and if borders, you know, are part of the problem, they're almost inevitably going to be part of the solution as well, because I don't think whatever some academics might wish, which is a world without borders, we're not getting there anytime soon. Had, had an interesting question from, from the audience and it kind of dovetails uh, with, with this discussion. And it, it's, it's from someone who's a non-English speaker. So mm. they, they're curious about, you know, is there a, uh, a distinction to be made if you, you talk about, uh, you know, uh, boundaries or borders versus frontiers is, you know, is there something we, we just assume away because we think we speak the same language when we, yeah. you know, and, and I, I think that's, uh, that's, that's something to think about. It's an incredibly important question. And it's one actually that has preoccupied French speaking. Um, political geography and international relations in particular. So there's there's a lot of, I mean, without going too technical, there's a lot of scholarship that looks at the distinction between, for example, the frontier and the boundary. So the, the boundary is really, I, that's in terms of an area of interest, that's really where we look at the sort of technical legal demarcation of the line. Whereas the frontier is often an area where we would probably best think of it as a zone. So it doesn't really have a sort of fixed line or boundary. It's a kind of area um, where the ownership has, has a bit of back and forth, where it's not always clear who has sovereignty over that particular land or sea, or whatever it might be. So I think what the, um, the questioner, I think, has quite rightly picked up on is that depending on where you come from and also the language of your education, you right. will have different understandings of border, boundary and frontier. And that's a real issue because, as you know, as a diplomat, you know, when you look at treaties and organizations, they often have official languages. Right. You know? right. And what we think we're saying to one another in English, when it yes. gets translated into Spanish, French, Kiswahili, whatever, it can take on a, a whole different, you know, uh, world of signification. Uh, we need yeah. to be really cautious about that. I, you know, this triggered in my mind a, a, a problem too, and maybe it's uh, more for American English than uh, than uh, others others who speak English. But when we talk about the nation, uh, we're generally referring to what I I would technically call the nation state. That is a a place with a capital and, and, and borders. But other people, when they talk about nation, is not, it's not a border bound concept. It's a, you know, it's in your DNA. <laughs> you know, you, my example, you're always a Croat, no matter where you are, you know, and, and that, that I think is another one of those. Um, we, we need to be careful how, you know, when we're talking, talking about this, whether it's in the classroom or the public as well. Oh, well, yeah. And I mean, to give you another example, you know, if we talk, if we take faith communities. Oh, yes. As our yes. reference point. I mean, you and I both know that Muslims will talk about an Ummah, you know, which mm -hmm. is a sort mm -hmm. of broader community of believers. Right. You know, if you're in the Arctic and you're talking to an Inuit, you know, that Inuit homeland or that Sami homeland, 
is far, far, far bigger at one level um, than just simply a territory or a state. Um, it's transnational or it's imaginative, it's global. Yes. You know, yes. As you say, I mean, diaspora has often served to remind you that as well, is that the, the, the border is fuzzy, I think, at best. We, we had another question uh, and sort of what do you think is the most pressing uh, border issue uh, today? Uh, I, I think, I mean, at the risk of sounding parochial, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the parochial answer, then a more general one. The parochial answer, the one that keeps me awake at night is Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland. Mm. I think, as you know, and I'm sure many of the audience know, we left the European Union uh, very, very recently and um, I think it would be fair to say that le on leaving the European Union, we have put more pressure on, on that border between the North and South of Ireland. And I think it is absolutely incumbent upon any UK Prime Minister in particular to act with enormous caution because, you know, the island of Ireland, as I'm sure I don't over have to over rehearse, has absolutely um, been characterised by border related violence, not just for the last 40 years, but arguably really ever since um, the Anglo Norman occupation of the you know, 11th century. So I think that's one yeah. issue. Brexit has made Ireland more challenging. I think more generally, I, I, I frankly speaking, I, I worry about the immediate and cumulative impact of climate change on our borders. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, it's hard not to take seriously, for example, sea level rise and what that will do to the, if you like, the geophysical border between land and sea. So, you know, anyone living in Miami, for example, should have a very, very keen interest in sea level rise. Yeah. I, you know, on the, uh, your, your Northern Ireland point, uh, you know, I think our biggest border challenge is really our border with Mexico. Mm. And uh, it was interesting in this uh, yesterday, uh, the uh, Biden administration uh, released a series of documents about climate change. And it, it was, he, he had made a commitment to do this at the, at the very, very early stages of the administration and obviously with the Glasgow meetings coming up. But there was a separate document on climate change and migration. Uh, and, and I think it's something that I've only, become uh, aware of uh, recently, but we're seeing more and more uh, people coming from Central America being not, I mean, they're, they're, they're the traditional problems of human rights abuses and political repression and, and you know, that, that's gone on forever. But, but these are people who are, who simply have no economic future because of drought or what, whatever the, you know, the natural phenomena or climate change induced phenomena going on. And, and, you know, we have to be thinking about how does that change the way we consider migration? Uh, how how accepting should we be of, of people who are not driven out because of individual human rights violations, but something that's so hard to, to define as, as the economic impact uh, caused, by, uh, caused by climate induced drought. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's, again, it can't, partly, I think, comes back to international legal framework. So, you know, if we think about the sort of the major convention that addresses the rights of refugees, asylum seekers, much of that we find in the aftermath of the Second World War and driven by a very European experience, you know, which was, of course, the tragedy of the Holocaust and, and continental-wide displacement. Um, what I think we're now finding is that our international legal system was essentially premised, you could argue, in a, in a different kind of era. And obviously in more recent times, we, we now increasingly talk about an Anthropocene as opposed to a Holocene. I think yes. that's one element. I think the other element I really want to also, it's a cautionary note, is not to leave the impression that everything is down to climate change. You know, a lot of the things going on in Central America, are, as you point out, are long standing inequalities you know, structural violence, much of it has been made worse by governments uh, and elites that have had little to no interest in land justice, for example. But on the other hand, climate change, environmental stresses are probably going to make things even worse. 
And so a lot of those folks who are traveling north towards the US border are in essence, you know, they're partly driven by poverty, but they are probably justifiably thought of as climate, climate migrants. And our international legal system really hasn't got to grips with that category, yep. you know, yep. and that's our big challenge. We need to talk about these things and try to think about whether we can adopt systems that are just, fair and sustainable for both host communities, but also for those who are genuinely desperate. Yeah, I uh, we had a, a, a project here at George Mason, which which was looking at the sustainable development goals. And we, we kind of about a hundred people participated in it. We had various rooms, if you will, within this this discussion. And I co-chaired the room on uh, clean energy for all. And, and it, it, it was so striking to me that uh, unless we address the question of how do you get electricity to 400 million people in the subcontinent or in, in sub-Saharan Africa, six to 800 million. Uh, and you, you talk about dealing with climate change without dealing with this basic access, you're, you're going to get people who are going to leave, <laughs> you know, uh, because the, the basic, the basic needs that they have as individuals, families, and communities aren't be, aren't being met in this, you know, focus that that we have correctly on on the global climate problem. So there's there's another another dimension of that, and uh, you know, I think the migration issue really does pose another area of potential potential conflict uh, because we see nothing reducing the flows from Africa into into Europe or from South Asia and the Middle East. Uh, into uh, into Europe as well. So, uh, yeah, and I, and I think the other thing that's worth just you know reminding you know the audience as well is that you know world population currently stands at about seven point five billion. We're pretty confident by twenty fifty we're looking at nine and a half ten billion, and much of that growth will come in Africa and Asia. And they will and there's there's two issues going on. I mean, on the one hand, they will have their own resource needs and aspirations, which will require energy uh, in large part, but also many of those parts of the world which are going to experience population growth are also going to be more affected um, by climate change. Yep. So big challenges is how, how do an awful lot of people deal with excess water and excess heat? So keeping cool is going to be something I think that will only reveal further the fault lines between the privileged and the underprivileged. And that's not just true of Africa and Asia, it's actually going to be true increasingly of North America and Europe. So these really are big, big challenges. We can't talk about climate change and borders in isolation from energy population growth, for example. Well, it is, you know, it's a good example of a novel border because we're, we're in a sense creating <laughs> Creating a division between peoples that that you, you again you can't really put uh, put on a map. Um, I, the other thing I, I thought about too is as uh, we we've been talking is we tended to to think mainly uh, you know in terms of state to state or some of the transnational dimensions, but there's still uh, there's still conflicts that are internal to to a particular country. It's not based necessarily on you know what the border of the country is but it's within within that country you, you know can you can you draw a map of bosnia and herzegovina to use use the example i'm familiar with where you know all the croats would be here and all the uh, bosniak uh, will be here and the serbs here. and and my experience was no <laughs> yet these communities sadly seem to be trying to do everything they can to to keep the separation as opposed to, you know, try to internally, uh, you know, identify themselves as, as people of Bosnia and Herzegovina. But, uh, but I think we all, we also saw, and I think, I think from the European Union, there's also a warning here, which was, you know, much of the European project has been about creating a single integrated market and having an arrangement where um, borders were, were, were just simply less important, you know, so right. we had the so-called Schengen Agreement, where as a, as a EU citizen in the past, you know, I was able to often glide through um, national borders without, for example, having to even show my passport. And yet the pandemic has also revealed 
the capacity of borders to return really, really rapidly. Borders not only that restricted us, as we know, from uh, literally leaving our house unless we had a legitimate reason, but also where countries quickly re-establish borders and because they were pursuing different public health strategies. So I think it's really interesting, even within Europe that has long celebrated this yes. sort of common European home, how quickly that disintegrated in March, April 2020 onwards, and where now we're struggling to, re to re-establish the idea of a borderless Europe, because individual countries are having such different, if you will, pandemic-related experiences. Or, for example, communities have discovered that they quite like having those borders yeah. back. Yeah. You know, they quite like restricting um, the movement of some people as opposed to others. So I don't think even in Europe, um, there's a story here which you know can be described as uh, straightforward when it comes to borders. Well, uh, all I can say is this time has gone really fast. <laughs> We're we're uh, we're at the end of this. Uh, just uh, you know, terrific. It's a terrific book, people in the audience. Uh, you know, punch that little green green button. I want to thank thank Klaus for for his time uh, and um, thank George Mason uh, for partially sponsoring this this event. And uh, you know, please uh, please buy the book. It's uh, it's more than it's more than than a a a good read. It is an important read, and and I think uh, really is fit for the time. So with that, uh, thank you all. Thanks thanks for sharing your time with us.